I'm here to talk about food, and something every Malaysian loves to talk about as well. And I guess this is a, be a typical scene um, in any grocery store where you go in, grab what you need, go quick back home. Um, but there are some problems related to food. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. We're now questioning the kind of food that we're eating. Is it good enough? Do we know where it comes from? Is it safe? And what sort of processes has it gone through? And one of the problems that we're facing with food, and we've heard this before, is how come some countries and some people would have abundance of food or excess of food, yet there are still some communities out there that are malnourished or don't have fair and equal access to the kind of food that we have privy to. There's also a new problem of being malnourished today. In the past, and especially when I was growing up, and I'm half Chinese, so you don't never leave your table with, empty, with food on your plate. You just have to finish your food. Um, but yet, we have kids today facing extensive health problems, also related to food. They're not undernourished, they're just overnourished. And I can't blame them. Um, I'm a mother of uh, a teenager and a seven-year-old. Um, it takes a lot after a long day at work to go back and prepare a meal. You first need to stop at a shop. If it's not bad traffic, you need to purchase your meals, go back, let it thaw. The chopping kills us most of the time, preparation. And on average, it takes about 127 minutes to prepare a simple balanced meal at home. This is always a better option. Just drive through, get a quick meal. I did this uh, yesterday, so I'm guilty of it as well. <laughs> it was 8.30 and we're all hungry, and we, it's, it's a cheaper option sometimes. Uh, it definitely takes less time. And especially for people like me, we live in the city. Uh, we spend two hours a day on traffic, um, so we really don't have time. And another problem that is surrounding, especially in Malaysia, is our dependency on suppliers. Um, and an average farmer in Malaysia here is about 50 years old. So we're actually feeding off the hands of all the senior citizens. Um, not many young Malaysians are interested in farming. And on top of that, 70 to 80 percent of our food here are imported, mainly from Thailand, um, from, from Philippines as well, depending on the kind of crops. A lot of our meat actually comes from Australia. Occasionally, it does come from South America. And some of our best food is exported. There are actually some farms that actually grow food specifically, especially the organic kind, to be exported outside. And of course, we all know this, and we're facing this, and we feel this right now as well. Food prices are continuing to increase, not just in Malaysia, but I think globally as well. The reason being is population is increasing. By 2050, we would have 9 billion people, but we have the same amount of land, same amount of water, same amount of air. But yet we have to intensify our food production to meet the demands of the world. I don't like the C word, but I had to throw this in because capitalism is driving the way we manage our lives, the way we li live our lives, and the way we eat. Another issue that many of us are not sensitive to is how far has the food traveled before it got to us on our plate? It depends. Um, salmon, for instance, comes either from Japan or you have Norwegian salmon flown in as well. It would have traveled for at least 10 hours on a plane, frozen. Um, and then when it gets to Malaysia, it would have to be transported to various areas. And it's also a matter of perception as well. We, we, as we go to a restaurant and we order our food, I think we pay very, very little attention to observing what have we ordered, what's on our plate, and what it went through before it got to become food on our plate. And I wanted to show you a study that was done last year by a rubber bank farm, which shows that a lot of city kids didn't know much about farming. And I, I agree to this, because uh, 12, 15 years ago, what I do is I volunteer uh, for environmental talks in, in schools. 
And I went to an all-girls school right down in uh, Pudu. And I asked them a simple question, like, can anyone tell me where you get french fries from? And everyone unanimously said to McDonald's. <laughs> and I said, you're right. I mean, technically, you know, you, you get uh, french fries from McDonald's. But I said, I wanted to know what french fries were made of. And it took about 30 seconds to 45 seconds. And some kid at the back said, potatoes. So I was relieved. I was really happy. Like, she knew, she knew potatoes uh, could make french fries. And then I showed three pictures on the screen of three different plants. And none of them could identify <laughs> what used potatoes. So that was like, 12 years ago. And moving back forward, I, I did a camp for some kids down south in Johor. And we had to queue up in the village because we were doing a mangrove tour. And halfway through while queuing up, I think about six to 10 girls started running from the back. They were scared um, of something. You can see them like with fear on your face. And so as facilitators, we went to check out what, what, what was it that scared them. And as it was hard to find what was it that scared them, because right in front of me was a goat. Um, it was a scary goat, mind you. It was a really old goat, so he had all that beard and the horns. And, I, and we found out that these kids have never seen a goat before. And with an animal with an old horn, they thought it was a threat and started running away from it. So we had to sit them down and tell them, like, this is what mommy buys in the shopping mall, mutton, and you eat mutton curry. And they were like, oh, yeah, that's how it looks like. So in, in, in the US, it's a new disease that our children are facing now. It's called nature deficit disorder, where as we live in urban areas, we have less time to spend in nature. And we also don't do much stuff in nature. We rather go to shopping malls, especially Malaysians, than to go to the nearest waterfall. And it's becoming a serious problem. It's because we're not educating them well in terms of simple aspects of food production or appreciation for food. So we have to innovate. What's the solution? Population's going to grow. We're going to need more food. We're going to need more food um, in shorter amount of time spans. And the solution is actually two, two things. One is to how do you re-educate communities to look at food differently? And the second option is how can you be the source of food production? And what I'm going to share with you is my method of choice, uh, or what I think is this very simple solution. It takes only two minutes a day of your time to manage the system. It's all natural, and I'll explain later. It's also space independent, meaning it doesn't matter whether you live in a condominium or a bungalow with a huge amount of space. It's something that can be modified and is modular and fit, will be able to fit your needs. And what's important is it fits a lifestyle. And I think that's the most crucial part. No one wants to be burdened with a system that is difficult to handle, that gives you a thick manual which you have to read, or that requires you to go on Google. It's called aquaponics. I'm sure many of you have heard of it before. And aquaponics is a very open source and simple system uh, that allows you to produce food. And I'm going to quickly explain based on the diagram that you see. It's a closed loop system where you can actually farm fish and grow your own vegetables. And why I call it a closed loop system is because the water that's in the fish tank gets pumped up to the grow bed, which actually provides nutrients to the plants. And why I say nutrients is because fish poop is really good. It's got all the nitrates and all the phosphorus that you need. It goes straight into the grow bed, and the plants absorb all these nutrients from the water, filters the water, and then pumps back out filtered water back to the fish. So our system, which we have in our office and our homes, um, well, never re doesn't really require you to have a filter system inside because the grow bed is actually doing a filtration system for you. And this is what we have, a prototype that we rolled out early this year. So I'm part of a startup um, among the many things that I do. And we realized that um, Malaysians are intimidated by farming. Malaysians don't like to get their hands dirty. Uh, they always ask questions, does it smell? Do I have to feed it? I'm like, of course you have to feed the fish, right? Um, so they, they, want, they want to have it, but they don't want the responsibility that comes with it. 
And so we had to come up with a, something that was a nice hook for them to start to appreciate the basic systems of aquaponics. So we came up with a gumball series, which comes in multiple colors. And what it does is it, was, it becomes your little mini aquarium on your desk or in your garden or at your workstation. And we found out that we ran an experiment. We rolled out 100 of these prototypes out. And we went to a shopping mall. And we managed to get 78 people purchasing this. And the main marketing strategy was basically for them to look at beautiful fish inside and healthy mint or basil growing outside. And it was sold. It turns out that we thought Malaysians didn't weren't interested in it, but when they saw it, it, you can see that glow in their face. They were like, oh my god, I can grow, have my own fish, I can grow my own herbs. So this was great for starters. Uh, it was a great hope to actually get people to understand what aquaponics was. It was simple and effective. Um, you know, you got beautiful fragrant gro herbs growing right in your room. It can be indoor or outdoor. And I guess just the presence of fish swimming and the sound of water uh, was very calming as well. So this is one way that we try to educate people to kind of understand the basics of aquaponics. But the biggest solution is this. A bigger version of it, this is right outside uh, my office, uh, where we actually have growing on top there spinach, uh, watercress, and also mint in, the, in three rows. And we grow, uh, we grow tilapia, and we grow sun hock. Sun hock is a very... Uh, highly prized fish, and Chinese New Year's coming up, you all know that. Um, it's, it's delicious. And we actually consume the produce from our aquaponics system perhaps twice to three times a week, because a typical cycle for vegetable growing is about three weeks. And it helps us um, provide all the leafy vegetables and edible fish that we eat. And we call ourselves tinkerers. It's because the people behind um, working on this aquaponics system, we're not agricultural experts. Um, we're not fish experts, uh, we're definitely not botanist or any plant expert. We're just passionate about growing our own food. And we trust what we grow. And we enjoy uh, the taste of what we grow. This is a bigger version. Um, what it has um, become um, is that big developers are looking into aquaponics or in a fancier term, they call this edible landscapes, urban gardens, as a way to improve the life of communities in the townships that they built. And as we can tell, like if you need a bag of basil leaf or just a twig or two of curry leaves, if you don't live in an area where it's convenient for you to go out and get food, you have to drive quite a number of you know, kilometers just to go buy something which you could have easily grown. So this concept of um, edible gardens as a placemaking effort uh, is growing very, very popular in Malaysia. And here you can see on every floor in a condominium that we um, helped with um, in the Jalan Kuching, every floor had an aquaponic system, and around it were, were plants like um, lemongrass, citronella, curry leaves, uh, pomelo. And so, so the idea is communities can walk out the comfort of their condominium and grab whatever they want and bring it back home and start cooking it. So over here, you can see how green and fresh the vegetables are. The fish are a bit small, but eventually when they grow, uh, communities can come and harvest whatever they need. So the biggest system helps you produce more food, helps you produce more edible fish, and this is what we call modular farms. Um, and this is a good example where an existing fish pond already existed in the home, and the owner wanted us to look at um, integrating farming into his fish pond system. Um, so it's very easily done, and you can see you don't just have one farm. As you can tell, there's four grow rates. You can actually grow four different crop crops all at the same time. And why is this solution important, and how do we reach out to the people, and, and who do we reach out to? Um, first and foremost are urban families. Um, it's important to, for us, as we feel, to influence how communities think about urban farming. And I think the technology has always been there. The trick is how do we innovate the delivery of information to the right people so that we can amass or empower communities to look at farming from a totally different perspective. Farming is not something a farmer or only a farmer does. Farmer is something every one of us here in this room is very capable of. 
So we do this by showing designs. We innovate via designs. We innovate via, via different ways of um, integrating our designs into their homes. A second way is also how we influence institutions. We work with academia to look at measuring water quality in our, in our systems to ensure that fish are growing healthy, uh, the food are growing well. Um, and ter thirdly, we also work with assistant champions and leaders. There's so many people who are into aquaponics, but this is who you, what you call enthusiasts. So we're trying to bring these enthusiasts out into a public domain to kind of encourage more communities to look at aquaponics as something everyone can learn, no matter what your background is. And in the future, this is something we're working on and trying to pitch to a couple of investors and um, how we can actually digitize this whole system. Um, our vision is to actually have an app on your phone where if you're traveling, and one of the problems with urban uh, folks is we travel a lot. So if you have a system like that, who's going to Who's going to man it? Your fish might die, or maybe you're really attached to the fish and you just really want to see how your fish is doing, and you don't have any friends that are free enough to come and feed your fish. Um, so we're working and developing an app and a technology where, at a, uh, with an app on your phone, um, and, and of course, cameras in your tanks, you're able to actually observe and know um, the parameters that make the system work. So whether tomorrow you want to see, I want to decrease the volume of water that's flowing from the grow bait to there because it looks like it's retaining too much water top, you can actually control it through your phone. So essentially, you are uh, connected to your farm, although you could be thousands of miles away. And it's almost like Farmville, except it's better. <laughs> You're growing real food. Um, I'm, I, it, we're, we're only restricting to fish, no cows, no ducks yet. And, and this is the future that we see. We have a designer that works very closely with us and also with the communities that we work with, continuously working on innovative designs. At the end of the day, everyone lives in houses that are of different shapes and sizes. You want something to look good in your house or along with your house and not make it like stick out like a sore thumb. So there are many choices for your house. The future for us is to in integrate modern farming into all segments of society where people can food share, and we can network with each other and create a community uh, of abundance. And this is our vision, to try to put a farm in every place, every nook and cranny, every school, every office, and every rooftop in the country. And Dixon Dysphomia has said that if every rooftop in New York implements a vertical farm, New York no longer have to worry about food. And this is something we're trying to do in Malaysia Hopefully, with your support, we're able to convince people that farming is cool. And this is us. We come from different backgrounds. One's a PR lobbyist, one's a town planner. I do marine biology work, marketing, and we've, of course, got a TV host, a radio host as well. And all of us have one thing in common. We love to grow, and we love to learn how to grow more. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah.